Okay, so um, hi everybody. It's great to meet you virtually, which is pretty much all we seem to do nowadays. Um, Peter, I've sort of got to know a little bit over time after being in his group and then, um, you know, discussing various things. Uh, for a while I had mold illness and uh, it's one of the reasons why I entered the chronic illness group. Um, and I've had other health issues in the past myself. So, and um, I've, in the meantime, added all sorts of qualifications and become a nutritionist and all sorts of things. So he's asked me to speak today. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk about Gut Health 101, uh, what you don't know. So the purpose of today's talk is to uh, understand gut health or digestion better including what exactly it is. Uh, we sort of have a vague idea, but, but you know, what, what really are the specifics of it? Um, what's the role of the gut in your health and well-being? Um, I also want to explain a bit about how the gut works, the importance of not just the gut flora and microbiome, which we hear a lot about, but also the physical and chemical digestive processes, but in easy to understand language that people often seem to um, not be aware of or don't quite connect in, in connect it all up together and where diet and lifestyle fit in. Just to tell you about myself, and I don't like talking about myself, but just so you know who I am, um, I'm a functional nutritional therapist. So I use uh, food, nutrients, supplements, um, and lifestyle. So diet, supplements, lifestyle as um, therapy for people who are often chronically unwell with ongoing illness. Uh, but I, the functional point means that I like to get to the root cause rather than just looking at symptoms. And while symptomatic relief is obviously important, especially with something ongoing, um, getting to the root cause will hopefully alleviate some of those symptoms. Um, I'm also an integrative health coach, which is sort of how I started this. Well, actually, how I started this journey was becoming a yoga teacher and then adding in the nutrition side, which I've always been passionate about since being a teenager. Um, so integrative health coach, so looking at the body as a whole. Um, and I'm also a transformation coach, which is something I've added in in the last year because the mindset aspect can be really important and people can have... Um, emotional kind of blockages sometimes to things. So that's a really, really wonderful thing that I've added in recently. I'm a restorative wellness practitioner. So I do, I'm trained in a lot of lab testing um, processes, gut testing, biochemistry, hormones, those sorts of things. Uh, I don't know if many of you watch Tom O'Brien, Dr. Tom O'Brien, he's a New York Times bestselling author. I have studied with him on um, gluten, all about gluten, gluten free and the role of that. So I'm a practitioner in that. I've um, studied about mold, I'm a yoga teacher. So, um, the breath can be a really important aspect of, of wellness. And uh, I've done a whole lot of other sort of courses with people like uh, Dr. Karatsian. But um, if you have questions, I think Peter's already mentioned to some people, put them in the chat box or save them and hopefully I'll get to answer them all in the end. If not, I'll sort of send people links and those sort of things. Also to any questions that I might not be an expert in and, and you want, would like to know an answer to. So let's begin. Where does digestion begin? Uh, this, in this diagram, you can see there's a map sort of from the mouth through to the stomach. You've got the gallbladder and liver and, and pancreas there. You've got the small intestine and large intestine. So that is largely um, what we consider to be the digestive system. Digestion is something that happens from north to south. And uh, what we call our gut is really our digestive system. So it's everything from the mouth down. It's chewing in our mouth. It's our stomach where proteins and, and rest of food, but especially proteins are broken down further. Um, it's the small intestine where the gallbladder and liver come in and um, emulsify, digest fats, but also continue the breaking down of carbs and proteins. It's um, absorption, which happens largely in the small intestine, but also in the large intestine. Uh, in the large intestine, it's where key nutrients are created, uh, where things like water are recycled, and it's also about elimination as well. But 
Actually, one thing people often don't think about um, until I sort of mention this and then, then people start to sort of think back to incidents or things that might have happened with them, but digestion really begins in our brain. Um, it's about the, the access from the brain down. So you've probably heard of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous states that our uh, nervous system goes into. So the sympathetic state is called, um, nicknamed fight and flight, and that's the old sort of reptilian thing, survival mechanism that we have where, um, where blood stops flowing to our organs, we get ready to literally run away from that saber-toothed tiger. All our digestive processes stop for that because our priority is survival. So for digestion to be triggered, we have to be in rest and digest mode, uh, which is the parasympathetic mode. And if that doesn't happen, you know, the saliva where, um, you know, and the other digestive juices in the stomach uh, from the pancreas and further down won't be triggered. So we, will, we won't be digesting properly and it can lead to indigestion. And not only that, but if we do eat in that state, our food won't be broken down or absorbed properly. So it can be, it can be problematic if people are constantly stressed, which is not uncommon these days and, um, and uh, uh, eating in that sort of state. But our gut is much more, our gut or digestive system is much more than that. It's where most of our immunity is 70%, 70 to 80%, um, the research differs a bit, is of our immunity lies there. So it's a really critical place um, in terms of our immunity. It's uh, been nicknamed our second brain because actually we have more neurons or nerve cells there than in our brain, which is you know quite mind boggling. And it's often, it's where a lot of our neurotransmitters are made, things like serotonin and GABA, which are really critical to our mood and, and our well well-being. These are where these are our happy kind of neurotransmitters, um, so they're important for that as well. Um, our microbiome is actually an organ that weighs between one and two kilos, depending on um, the health of its 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 health, how how many microbes we do have, um, and it's often nicknamed our second genome um, because we co-evolved. And this is one of the reasons why people think um, we became more intelligent um, fairly quickly in, in sort of the scheme of things than uh, perhaps some other animals because we co-developed with um, other DNA from these microbes. So to give you an, import, an example of how important um, our second genome or our microbiome is, um, we have our human genome, we have fewer genes than a nematode worm does. So that's how critical our relationship um, is with our microbiome. So we really depend on it for a lot of things. So this is a bit sort of controversial and research is, this is an area where there's a lot of research being done. Now everybody's sort of looking into it, but estimates differ, but we have around 30 trillion microbes in our body. Um, if, you, if you imagine also, um, our microbiome connects us with our outside world and helps us to adapt to the outside world. So if you imagine that our human body is like a donut, you know, a chocolate donut or something like that, and the hole in that donut is our gut. And if you sort of extend that donut and that long narrow passage in the middle, middle becomes our gut. So we bring in food from the outside world and in our gut, our digestive system, that's where we meet the outside world and, and adapt to the outside world. It, we break down food and that's where we absorb all our nutrients. So it's really important in terms of our relationship with our environment, our immunity, our adaptation to our environment. So um, in terms of cells, 57% of our cells are non-human. Um, which is quite incredible. So uh, they come from our, this microbiome that we co-developed with. Uh, our uh, um, microbiome diversity is, the greater our microbiome diversity, the better our health. And there's very strong research showing that. But we also have a microbiome, which a lot of people don't realize on our skin. 
um, in our brain, our lungs, and basically have microbes all throughout our body playing really critical roles in terms of our health. So I like to think of our gut as our command and control center, and it really is the foundation of our health and well-being. Not to say that all of our health is about our gut, but it certainly is, is you know, the starting point and a critical area of our health that influences everything. So Hippocrates, you might have heard this um, saying, Hippocrates said that all disease being, begins in the gut. And while he said, said it all those thousands of years ago, we're now actually proving through research that this is correct. So in our society these days, the modern world with our you know, lifestyles, stressful lifestyles, um, the drugs that we take, the chemicals in our environment, um, and the foods that we eat importantly. There's a, an epidemic, a silent epidemic often of digestive issues. And, and perhaps you've noticed all the ads on TV for Gaviscon and all sorts of pain relief and those sorts of things, which can, a lot of them can be brought back to our gut health. So there's a lot of people with constipation, a lot of people with gas bloating and, and digestive kind of pain. Um, heartburn, reflux, GERD, um, there's an epidemic of that. One in five Australians has IBS, which is um, a bit of a sort of syndrome, a bit of a non-specific description of, of what might be going on in our gut, the problems that we might have there. Diarrhea, some people alternate between constipation and diarrhea or have constant diarrhea. Food sensitivities with, or, or possibly allergies too. Um, our digestive issue, SIBO. Um, other, other things that people are suffering from commonly are hernias, ulcers, Crohn's disease, gallstones, pancreatitis, polyps, uh, malabsorption, gastritis, and autoimmune diseases like ulcerative colitis. And even cancers um, and directly uh, related to digestion as colon, esophageal, stomach cancers are all things that, that um, there's a bit of an epidemic out there, unfortunately. So a lot of people, as I mentioned before, when they focus on gut health, they talk, they're thinking about the microbiome or our gut flora. And you, you would have seen the ads for probiotics and there's a, there's a lot of stuff, programs and all sorts of things on television being advertised. Uh, um, if, and really, you know, focusing on that, the importance of our gut flora, which is, is very important. But what a lot of people don't focus on is the physiological and biochemical aspects of our digestion. So they're the things I was talking before, you know, are we in rest and digest mode? Um, are we chewing properly? Um, and what's happening in our stomach, our gallbladder, et cetera. And I'll go into a bit of detail this, about this in a moment. So basically you can focus and try and fix your gut mi microbiome. You can try and improve your flora and create balance. But if you don't fix these things further north, they're just going to come back. So it's something that a lot of people forget about. So I wanted to talk about the steps of digestion and how it works. Digestion begins in our brain, as I said. We need to be in a... a uh, rest and digest mode in parasympathetic mode in terms of our nervous system so that all those digestive juices and processes will be triggered. So when we smell food, um, you know, you, saliva is released in the mouth where it's chemically and mechanically broken down. So it's important that we chew there. In the stomach, so we chew our food in the mouth, um, we, saliva comes in and starts to break down carbohydrates. Um, it, through muscle contractions, that is brought down the esophageal tract into the stomach. In the stomach, we have hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, and they begin further take that breaking down of food process along. And stomach acid is also really important because it's, uh, they kill off pathogens, so pathogens uh, things that we don't want in our body, like parasites, viruses, bacteria, yeast, and stomach infection called H. pylori, which can is one of the potential causes of ulcers and can be quite serious in terms of health. It, um, it can be linked to things like stomach cancer. So the important thing about stomach acid is that we need enough so that 
the acidity of that broken down food there reaches a pH, so an acid alkaline sort of balance of 1.5 to 3. And it has to release that before that food now called a chyme is released into the small intestine. So that chyme, that broken down food, once it is released from the stomach and enters the small intestine, the pancreas releases different enzymes to further break it down. And food molecules are tagged here um, by our body uh, to be rebuilt as our, our DNA. So you can see a direct relationship here between what we eat and, and how it's going to be food for our cells. So that DNA is instructions to our cells um, to tell it, tell it what to do, tell them what to do. So when our, goal, when our body detects fat in that food, some of it is uh, broken down in the stomach, but it needs to be further emulsified here. So um, turned into something water soluble that our body can use. So the gallbladder responds, it releases bile acids, which are kind of very acidic kind of salt to do, to do that emulsification and so that our body can utilize those nutrients from the fats. So peristalsis or the, or the muscle contractions I was talking about before, move the food down the small intestine where we have things called villi and they are finger-like projections that increase the surface area of our small intestine by 60 to 120 times. And that allows our body to absorb the maximum amount of nutrients. So you can see how important the small intestine and these villi are for actual food absorption. And the remains of what hasn't already been absorbed, the fiber and undigest, non-digestible fiber and other things and things our body doesn't use, they pass through a valve called the ileocecal valve into the large intestine. And in the large intestine, um, this is where most of our microbes live. The small intestine is, is largely uh, not a place where, it's largely sterile, not a place where we have a lot of microbes. Um, if we have too many there, they can actually cause damage. But in the large intestine, important things happen too. It's not just where waste is sort of expelled, but those fibers that we have are used to make short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids um, are created by our microbiome there, and they feed the cells in our lining. And our lining is really critical, as I explained before, like that sort of extended donut. There's a, that our lining is one cell thick. Um, it's where a lot of our immune system um, lies in a mucus there and without the right food the microbiome can't create these short chain fatty acids. In the large intestine also we synthesize or, or make vitamins K, B12, B1 which is thiamine and B9 folate and these are all critical for every single cell reaction that happens in our body. So if we're in a constant state of stress, this puts our nervous system into that fight and flight mode that I talked about before, failing to, to trigger our digestive processes. And that means that if our food isn't chewed properly, it's not sufficiently broken down. The carbs, as I said, this is where carbs start to be broken down. That won't start to happen. And already our digestion is compromised because our food is failing to be broken down properly. Yeah, uh, if we have low stomach acid, which is chronic these days, um, it, often we don't have enough minerals in our diet to create stomach acid, or we have a high carb diet, or we have a stressful lifestyle, or maybe we take a lot of PPIs or, or uh, anti sort of um, antacids, or we drink a lot of alcohol. So our, that, that means that our first line of defense against the nasties, the pathogens is gone. And also that means that our food isn't broke, broken down properly and that can lead to infections and, and issues further down south in that process of digestion. If, that, if we don't have enough stomach acid um, in addition, the food doesn't require, reach that required pH of 1.5 to 3. And so it sits in the stomach too long and ferments and putrefies. It basically is sort of going off and it's, but it's got to go somewhere. So it tends to come up the weaker spot, which can, can be uh, the, uh, up into our esophagus. And that's what we call gastric reflux, heartburn or GERD. 
So ironically, you know, um, people take antacids for the immediate relief, but ironically, it's low stomach acid that is creating and going to perpetuate this problem. In the small intestine, um, when food is, is undigested from the lack of chewing and the lack of proper digestion in the stomach, this can damage that actual one, one cell thin lining that we have, widening the gap between the normally tight junctions there. And this allows food particles that are too big, bacteria, viruses, and other toxins to pass directly into bloodstream, which is sitting on the other side of, of our gut. And here's an image here to show you the normal, um, on the left-hand side, you've got the normal tight junctions. And on the right-hand side, um, it's an image of what happens to the junctions when they're damaged or become leaky and inflamed. So you can see nasty things going in there, which is going to trigger a, an immune response, which um, is not what we want. Another thing that can go wrong is if we eat a diet that is too low in, flat, in fat, um, which for a long time we thought we believed was healthy, but there's a lot of research now showing that that is not the case. Rather than having low fat, we need the right fat, uh, which is not the inflammatory um, kind of uh, vegetable oils that a lot of us thought was the healthy option for us. So that means that the gallbladder basically stand, stagnates. It doesn't have a role and the bile sorts can sit, sit there and, and form stones. So that's one potential uh, cause of gallbladder problems and gallbladder stones. So um, another thing that can go wrong is um, foods that we eat regularly that are, in, and are not digested or broken down properly, our immune system may not recognize them as, as you know, say you have eggs every morning, our immune, and, and that's not broken down properly, it passes through our gut into our bloodstream, our, blood, our immune system says, I don't recognize that, that's hostile, so it tags us as hostile. And this is the beginning of food sensitivities. It's called a loss of oral tolerance. And if it, this goes on for a long time, this is, can actually create allergies and autoimmune disease. Uh, another potential issue is that valve between the small and large intestine, which is meant to stop the bacteria from our large intestine entering our small intestine. That can get stuck. It can be a spot where bacteria and parasites and things that haven't been eliminated from because of this poor digestion. They love to hang around that sort of spot. So, and that can um, cause something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or IMO, which is um, a, a now a, a type of type of SIBO. Um, and that's where bacteria from the colon can enter this, the small intestine and create havoc because it's not supposed to be there. It can actually damage our gut and it, that if that is allowed to perpetuate, uh, to go on for a long time, it can lead to malabsorption. And it's said actually that um, research shows and really solid research shows that now that 80% of people diagnosed with IBS actually have SIBO. So we're learning more and more about that with, um, with research. In the colon or large intestine, uh, we can get we can get infections, so we may not have enough good bacteria there. They might have been killed off by by our high sugar diet or um, too many antibiotics, um, and we can get the bad bacteria who normally live there but are kept in check by the good bacteria. They can take over. We can get yeast and fungal infections. Parasites uh, can proliferate there, or even viral infections. And the problem with these bacteria and and, and things is that they can produce something that is really harmful for us called LPS. They live in the outside lining of this bacteria and they can alter our acid alkaline balance and they can create further leakiness in, in that um, large intestine and of course SIBO which I mentioned before. So we need, we need a good balance of bacteria to keep those bad bacteria which are sitting there looking for an opportunity to proliferate. Um, also, we can lack those, those healthy short chain fatty acids. So if we don't eat enough um, undigestible fiber in, in, in whole foods, like particularly vegetables, but also whole grains, then they won't have enough food. So we will end up having too few of them. And then um, we get compromised um, gut lining. 
Another thing that can go wrong is motility. And this is something I'm seeing increasingly in my clinic where the mu muscle contractions fail to work properly and food isn't moved along. It can actually get stuck, sort of get stuck, um, create some blockages and overgrowths and even malabsorption. So this can be caused by nerve damage from something like food poisoning. Um, that's a common cause, but also gut brain access issues. Um, and possibly, you know, traumatic brain injury or brain disease. I wanted to talk a bit, a bit about nutrition now and why that matters. What, what the role you, um, your food, what you take into your body plays in your gut health. And I, I like to use the simple analogy of putting fuel in the car. You wouldn't put bad fuel in your car and expect it to perform and not service it and expect it to perform at optimal sort of optimally and the same goes for your diet if you put poor fuel in which is your diet but also it's more than diet it, it's your lifestyle it's stress it's your environment it's things like you know do you have mold in your house um, do you eat a lot of chemicals or processed sorts of things all of those things can lead to uh, you know poor functionality in our body so one thing I learned, and, and it sticks with me every day I think about this, digestion is fundamental to our health. And why? Because every single cell in our body that makes up every tissue, which makes up every organ, depends on your body's digestive system to provide the nutrients that it needs to keep on functionally optimally, functioning optimally. So another quote from Hippocrates, um, who had, as I said, a lot of foresight, our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. And this is something that people can't believe the power of food, but I've seen it, my, me and my colleagues have seen it time and time again, the power of diet and lifestyle, nutrients um, and, and less stress on, on the body, on, on the health can be incredible. So basically every mouthful you eat either harms or nurtures you. So maybe, you know, it's something I like to remind myself of because we, we all get tempted by things out there and especially when we see other people eating what we think is normal food but is often high carb food and or processed food, junk food, those sorts of things. Um, you know, it's, it's a useful thing that I like to remind myself, do I want to be nurtured or do I want to be harmed with this food today? And we might decide, you know, every now and then it's okay to have something and then we enjoy it, that's fine. So just going on to the, into the basic, I talk, talked about HEP cells and how they work. So as I said, cells are the basic unit of life. They make up our tissues, which is our blood and bones and organs, our, our structure and all the things around our structure and, they, and, and provide energy. So we need the right nutrients to function. Uh, mainly, interestingly, our body functions, it needs fats and proteins for its structure and, and much of its function, and including for brain health. But we also need micronutrients, which is all the vitamins and minerals from our food. And if we don't have those things, we, we will have imbalances and eventually disease can set in. But we also need that proper digestion, proper gut health, uh, so that we can break down the food. And absorb nutrients so it's not just what you eat but what your body can do with that those foods that food those nutrients that we eat so while medicines and diets you know can help our gut they can relieve digestive symptoms things like antacids laxatives and antiemetics you know anti-nauseal medicine and sometimes we might need those things and while, you know, you hear a lot about people going on particular diets, but, you know, for the rest of their life, FODMAP or, or GAPS or lower oxidate, or all sorts of antihistamine diets, all sorts of things, which can be great for symptoms, but they might not address the root cause, which is, as I said, that's what I'm about, is trying to find the root cause of what might be going wrong in, in someone's health. Just to give you some simple solutions, Number one, nothing is, you can't up, out supplement, you can't outsmart, you can't out, out exercise a poor diet. So it's really critical that we eat how we've evolved to eat over hundreds of thousands of years, which is basically whole food as it comes from nature, nothing processed, nothing refined, nothing with additives like chemicals and preservatives. 
and also nothing that's altered because while GMOs don't affect human cells, they do, they do affect our, our microbes. Um, and that's been shown in research as well. Um, so nothing that's GMO, if you can, it's very hard to find these days, um, whether something is GMO or not, the labeling has been, um, restrictions have been eased, but nothing that's been hybridized, you know, over, and particularly since the 1970s, there's been a, a massive amount of hybridization in grains in, and legumes that's happened. Uh, nothing refined, unfortunately, pasteurized and homogenized foods, uh, you know, dairy, for example, is pulled apart and put, put back together and all the good stuff has been killed off and grain fed meats, which means you have a lot less nutrients in that meat. For example, you have, um, you have three times more healthy fatty acids in meats that are not grain fed. So if, in terms of um, getting your maximum amount of nutrition, try and go as natural as possible. But also, you know, we, we often let full food rulers as well with coffee you know we get addicted to sugar it gives us that instant sort of happy hit uh, alcohol drugs and junk food so i mean they're whole foods they're basically your one ingredient sort of foods um people don't may not like to cook these days but there's a lot you can do that's really delicious that's very simple and doesn't take a lot of time my um nutritional um, solutions. I've got some really simple solutions, things that you can do at home. Hydrate, number one thing after, after eating real food. Along with that is um, to drink clean water. So preferably water that hasn't got chemicals added to it, it's, has plenty of minerals in it. Um, it is actually the most common nutritional deficiency. Time and time again, most of my clients are not drinking enough water. And sometimes this can be an incredibly powerful way to improve someone's health very quickly. It can be, you, in terms of digestion, you, the signs of this of dehydration can include heartburn, constipation and colitis. So making sure that someone is hydrated is, is the number one basic thing. And if you are drinking something that uh, is dehydrating, like coffee or a soft drink or juice, even um, alcohol, you might, it's, it's important to have two, two extra glasses of water just to bring you back to the, that status quo. Fibre, so 5.1, so one in 20 Australian adults eat enough vegetables and fruit. And that's a conservative estimate in terms of what we need for vegetables and fruit. But it, this is so critical for fibre, for our evacuation, for our digestive health. And of course, for the, the micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that our body needs to fight things off and to be healthy. Um, Fibre also contains something called prebiotics, uh, which is the that indigestible stuff that, that our, is, our body can't use, but that our bacteria must have because that's what they live off and that's what nourishes them. And that creates what I talked about before, the, or the nutrients that feed those short chain fatty acids, which feed and, and guard our gut lining. So some prebiotic foods, just quickly fruit, vegetables, artichokes, asparagus, onion, garlic, um, apple sauce is great, green bananas, cooked and cooled rice and potatoes, uh, and nuts, grains and legumes, which have been soaked for 24 hours preferably, or at least 12 hours because they um, can have inflammatory nutrients. And of course this assumes, you know, if, if legumes are not good for you, if they don't agree with you, and they're, they're one of the hardest things for the body to digest, then of course, I'm not saying you should have them, you can leave them out, but if you do have them, they're best soaked. So some simple things you can do to improve your stomach acid status. So um, drink, you can drink up to one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar 15 minutes before you eat. If you react to this, it means that your gut is inflamed and irritated and you probably need to do some gut healing first and you might need some expert help with that. Um, drinking warm lemon juice is, is a great thing to uh, put some enzymes into your body to clean out your system and to get, get your digestive juices and stomach acid going. Bitters, which can uh, help your stomach acid so much, but also um, your gallbladder and liver to get going is a good thing. And something that uh, can help with that is uh, zinc, which is a chronic shortage because 
we don't have a lot of minerals left in our over farmed soils and men especially need a lot of zinc so that's something worth um, considering supplementing in but um, you know you've got to consider that in the scheme of, of what else you're doing for your health so optimizing your digestive enzymes um, they're important in both your stomach and your small intestine because they break down further break down carbs and proteins um, and if you don't have enough it can lead especially to yeast and fungal overgrowth things like thrush and candida itchiness um, yeah uh, that, um, that can cause constipation all sorts of problems um, and and really affect your immunity so some natural digestive enzymes that you can consider eating with or before your food uh, are pineapple and papaya. Uh, optimizing your fat digestion, as I said, low, don't eat low fat, but you know, do, people are different in terms of their, the way that they can, what fats they can tolerate and how much. Uh, sometimes if you can't tolerate fats, that can be a real sign of, of gallbladder issues. Um, some people tolerate animal fats better than others. Um, some people thrive off, other people might not thrive off it so much. But the main thing is to eat sort of natural fats and avoid those vegetable oils because they are super inflammatory on your body and most of, most of them are rancid and toxic. They are fats that degrade very quickly, um, so they're not healthy to have olive oil, organic butter, coconut oil, and possibly animal fats. If you're someone who can tolerate them, can be all, all be good for you. So um, foods that aid fat digestion, raw beetroot, and I have a raw beetroot uh, recipe, salad recipe that I give people, it helps people a lot, radishes and dandelion root. So gut nurturing foods, apple sauce is great. Uh, I've got a recipe for that on my website, so you have to cook it in a certain way until the skin goes shiny. And that's got something called pectin, which feeds our good bacteria, and it's also healing for that gut lining. Bone broth is high in collagen. Again, that heals and seals that gut lining. If there's any leakiness going on there, and you would have heard a lot, I'm sure, about fermented foods like fermented vegetables, kefir, kombucha, and so on. Um, if you can tolerate dairy, a hard cheese like a parmesan that's been fermented longer term, and yogurt, uh, you can have coconut if, if you yogurt if you can't tolerate dairy, and they are full of probiotics and uh, they feed our good bacteria. And some of those probiotics, um, a lot of what we have in terms of supplements doesn't last through our, doesn't um, live through our digestion, but when you have it in whole food firm form, it does uh, survive. So here are just some examples of those things, sprouts, the fermented vegetables, applesauce, and the bone broth, which is something very simple and cheap. You'd make at home, quite expensive. You buy it in the shop, but you can buy jars of concentrate, which some people find really useful. Reducing sugar and refined carbs. Um, according to statistics, uh, two thirds of our diet now is carbs and mostly refined carbs. So not, not the carbs that we get from vegetables, um, leafy vegetables or starchy vegetables, or the carbs that we get from whole grains and legumes, but carbs that come from sugar, flour, uh, those white rice, those sorts of things. And why this is important is because apart from the fact that there's empty calories that is, you know, behind chronic diseases like diabetes, blood sugar issues, um, PCOS, all sorts of modern chronic diseases, sugar is the most inflammatory food that you can eat. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. And pretty much everyone that comes through my clinic door, they have a blood sugar problem because what has become normal and new normal is not really a normal diet that our body has evolved over all those thousands of years to eat. Um, and why is inflammation important? Inflammation, which usually starts in our gut, is associated with 90% of disease and especially chronic disease. Um, including autoimmune diseases of not always, but sometimes um, Parkinson's, MS or Alzheimer's heart disease is a big one, allergies, asthma, arthritis, diabetes, and even cancer. So it's, it's a big one that um, can be quite challenging for people to give up, but that can make you feel really um, amazing and really improve your health if you can get on top of that one. So one of the reasons why we're actually made to eat sugar and fat, you know, it's something that, that 
we've evolved to sort of binge on because when food was um, was in short supply sometimes, we would we would seek out these sources, put on some weight to use for the leaner times, which of course we used to have all the time through winters, etc. Now we don't usually have a shortage of food, especially in the, the modern world. Um, so, you know, we, we just keep on eating sugar and unhealthy fats uh, when, we, when we shouldn't. And one of the problems with sugar is that it is addictive. It actually lights up the brain um, in MRIs and, and sets off the same opiate sort of response that many drugs do. So it actually makes us feel good in the short term, of course, but then it makes us crash and feel bad. And that's when we want to eat more sugar to feel good again. So, and sugar has been linked directly with inflammation in the brain and higher rates of depression and anxiety. So it's one of, it's a big thing for, for health um, and chronic disease. So sugar isn't just added sugar. It's, it's our refined breads, um, it's our cakes. It's much more than just the table sugar or honey that we might think of as being sugar. So, Another thing that, that people might consider in terms of their health journey, especially while they're healing, is, is wheat and gluten. Um, I can talk about that another time. Soy, dairy, all these foods are very processed these days. They're very GMO. Um, they've been hybridised many, many times, especially since the 1970s, when we've seen a real spike in chronic disease. Um, a lot of them uh, have chemicals, um, sprays, all those sorts of things with us. Uh, vegetables um, and trans fats. So when, when it was realised that vegetables are very rancid and toxic quickly, they were, their structure was changed um, into trans fats, which is a big issue in the US, not so much here, but it is definitely something to avoid. Grain-fed meat, as I said, it's just not as nutrient dense. Um, food additives and anything that you might personally know that you react to, and I'm sure that a lot of people in the group will know what, what really sets them, triggers them. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. So reducing dependency on medicine can, can be, you know, you, you would need to talk to your doctor as well. But laxatives, over, those over-the-counter things are, are short-term, but they can really do damage in the longer term to the gut lining. They can stop your muscle action from working properly. PPIs can reduce symptoms. They are, if you read the instructions, they are, were never made to be taken long-term, two months at the most. And they have been li linked direct, directly to um, double the chance of getting stomach and small intestinal cancer. So long term, they can have some real um, side effects. Plus, they lower your stomach acid, so they, you know, you won't have that barrier to all those things from outside that are, you're ingesting through your food. It, you won't have the stomach acid to kill those off, so that can lead to overgrowth and all sorts of things. Antibiotics, while sometimes life saving, um, you know, it takes two to three years to rebuild your gut after uh, antibiotics. Um, so, you know, is there another alternative? Is, can you use herbs? Is there another way? We've sort of forgotten a lot of the more traditional medicine and ways to, to support our health without antibiotics. Um, it became a quick fix for a while. And the pill, which unfortunately, um, while quite liberating for women, it disrupts your estrogen digesting bacteria. And research showed that users of the pill have a 300 percent increase in Crohn's disease so it is def it's directly linked to disease plus it it depletes the body of a lot of other nutrients as well reducing stress stress is not something that's just a one-off it, it is additive and cumulative um, to form a total stress load so chronic prolonged stress does lead and this is shown in research to damage your gut um, and that can lead to disease. So these days, it's something that we might need to consciously work at is to, is to reduce our stress load. So you can see in this beaker of stress, we have a lot of natural stresses anyway um, in, our, in our environment, um, the foods we eat, um, the drugs that we put in our body, we've got EMFs and all those sorts of things. Um, dehydration, we might have deficiencies, we might have had surgeries, those sorts of things, we have financial, family stress, all repetitive, all those sorts of things. So our beaker of stress can quite often be quite full. Then if we have one event, we go from being almost filled 
to over the top and that's when our body really can suffer in the longer term when we do that to ourselves. So I use, a, I use a, an eight step digestive health system. So I look at the diet, that is first and foremost, you're not gonna really help anything without looking at that diet. That is such a critical component because it is the foundation of our health, it's the foundation of our self-health, which is the foundation of every single organ and system in our body. Lifestyle, as I said, stress can be important, including movement, we were made to move. Sometimes we're so ill that we can't do that, but it's something that we need to work towards. Um, and being in that rest and digest mode, as I said, is important. Chewing our food, very basic, very powerful. A lot of this sort of gold power food down now. Um, if we don't chew our food, then we won't have the beginning of those. That pro digestive process won't begin. Our stomach acid, our other digestive enzymes, are they working optimally? Um, do, is our bile sort of, um, is our gallbladder functioning well to, to bring the bile in that we need? And then what's going on in that small intestine and large intestine? And then we might have overrides. Um, we might have um, hormone problems. Um, we might have um, other sort of mental health issues. We might have environmental issues like mold, chemicals, um, all sorts of things. So they're all, they're, that's the whole sort of body as a system that I like to look at because you might have dressed six out of eight of these and still not be getting better. So what is it that's what is it not that we're not looking at here? We've basically got to look at the body as a whole and all of these aspects of our health. I also do stomach testing. So sometimes um, when when it's not enough just to look at the diet, we we can do um, it's possible to do uh, uh, testing, stool testing to which gives an amazing picture of have you got a stomach infection it measures your gut leakiness it it looks to whether you've got fat in your stool which is a sign that you're not digesting fat properly it tells us how you're reacting to gluten 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 is something in everybody that um, opens those tight junctions of the gut barrier so that's something that happens in everybody if you've got a healthy gut which is pretty unusual these days then your gut is going to repair within a few days but for most of us who have got gut challenges, one eighth of a gram of gluten can, cause, can mean six months of your gut having to heal from that. So that's quite powerful. Um, do, we, do, you have, do we have bacterial parasitic fungal overgrowths or undergrowths as well? What's the status of your gut immunity? Um, a lot of people have low gut immunity, which is low whole body immunity. What, are, what is your short chain fatty acid level like? Is your body detoxifying? Um, properly and then there is other testing you can do like hormone and SIBO testing and then that forms the basis of a personalized protocol so everybody is different in what's happening in their gut remove the infections replace the stomach acid the digestive enzymes um, re-inoculate so building up the beneficial bacteria so to bring those uh, uh, those damaging bacteria under control um, repairing the gut lining and the gut immunity. There are things you can do directly to improve that and rebalancing. So making sure that longer term diet, lifestyle and environmental and emotional factors are, are all in balance. So yeah, this is what I do. I, I create a personalized program for people. Um, I also do an in-depth health history. I, I do um, questionnaires online based on signs and symptoms, which give me very good idea as well without the gut testing about whether it's uh, whether you have issues in your stomach, is it your hormones, which are a consequence, is, uh, is there something going in your large intestine, your gallbladder or liver, um, is, is your heart health compromised as a consequence of your gut health and so on. And I do that through a package of four consultations. So um, just to summarize, digestion is key to your comfort and health, your overall health and immunity, as well as your mental and emotional well-being. And, and the gut brain, and con uh, gut brain connection is something I'm happy to talk about more, in more detail later on. Are you drinking water? Are you eating real food? Are you eating the gut nurturing foods um, and avoiding the gut killing foods like the sugar and carbs and drugs and additives, etc.? 
unfortunately these days we rather than just being able to go to the shop and buy food we need to really be conscious of what's in our food and work is something we need to work on what's your stress level like and, and this is all a great um starting point so i just wanted to mention too that if anybody wants to talk about whether um whether what i do nutritional therapy might be able to help mm -hmm. them i offer a free first chat free first consult basically so feel free to contact me